Hello friends, welcome to my channel and in this lecture I am going to talk about deconstruction. As you have found in my previous lectures that uh, my emphasis is to make it as easy as possible because primarily these lectures are designed to cater to the students who are preparing for UGC NET or they are preparing for MA entrance tests in the discipline of English or if they are uh, studying English as a part of their BA honors course or BA courses and uh, they need to learn it quick, they need to learn it uh, in a comprehensive manner and these are just uh, certain entry points that I am trying to provide and uh, that's why I would uh, say things in uh, brief and just highlight the key points and rest the students need to learn on their own. And if they have questions, definitely they can ask me, they can email me the questions. I would uh, leave my email ID in the description of this video. And uh, many of them are contacting me regarding that and I, I would really feel great and elated if you ask me questions related to what I want to discuss in my videos. So let's begin. Now deconstruction as you can see in the PowerPoint presentation, it's a part and parcel of what is known as post-structuralism. In the last video of mine, we have noticed that how structuralism flourished in the academia in the 1950s, 60s onwards and how it privileged the structure and whatever they are going to discuss, whatever they are going to talk about, they would always give extreme importance to the structure. That is to say, it doesn't matter whether it's a literary text, whether it's a cultural text, whether it's a cinematic text, whether it is a cultural practice, you can say, that also can be read as a text. The most important thing is the rules, the conventions, the protocols that each and every production needs to follow, the great chain, the great structure, the great network in which you have to locate that particular specific element, be, be it a literary text or a cinematic text. Right. So that is what is important. And if you see that uh, there would be a very important dichotomy between the signifier and the signified. I have explained this in my last video and you can go to the playlist or uh, press the I button to get uh, access to that video and uh, you can see what I have talked about structuralism or you can stru study structuralism on your own. Now, assuming that you know a bit of structuralism, I am going to talk about deconstruction in this lecture. So deconstruction basically came when there was already a very strong ground created by structuralism. Structuralism already had a very very strong base and uh, please do not think that when deconstruction came into being in the academia of the West, that is to say in the Ivy League universities of uh, say the United States of America or Europe. Even then, structuralism was not completely on the vein. It was it, it never eroded, so to speak. Right? It was still there, and uh, even today itself, you will find several structuralist critics who would deal with, uh, say, anthropology or uh, literary texts. They would come up with the idea of the structure and the network and how it functions. So structuralism never went away and that's why you would find that there is no hyphen between post and structuralism, these two words, right? In the post-structuralism, the word post-structuralism is a, as you can see, obviously it's a combination of two words, post and structuralism. Now there is no hyphen between them, right? So as you would find in uh, post-colonialism or post-modernism, you do not use hyphen. Now this may spark this question in your mind that why didn't why don't we use hyphens we don't use hyphens because there was no particular temporal 
difference between say structuralism and post structuralism never think that structuralism ended with the era of post structuralism right when post structuralism came the deconstruction with the post structuralist theories of uh, lacan uh, reading freud whether the post structuralist foucault came with uh, his uh, interpretation which challenged the conventional uh, marxist thinking whatever it is when post structuralism came never think that structuralism completely eroded right ne it never happened in that way and in fact if you don't understand structuralism properly you won't understand post structuralism as well in fact structuralism created that ground for post structuralism so there is no temporal disruption between post structuralism and structuralism in fact you have to understand structuralism you have to think like a structuralist to some extent even if you are doing a post structuralist critic criticism so basically deconstruction questions and claims to subvert or undermine the assumption that the system of language is based on grounds that are adequate to establish the boundaries the coherence or unity and the determinate meanings of a literary text now i am talking about deconstructive criticism right that's a particular critical strategy which was popularized by the yale school of critics so basically deconstruction or deconstructive criticism tries to undermine tries to subvert the assumption that the system of language is based on certain grounds that are adequate to establish the boundaries and center the coherence the unity the completeness right you can think of the new critics now right they would always go after unity coherence like balance so uh, before deconstruction before the arrival of deconstruction in the academy of the west new critics were extremely popular and they were gaining their grounds and you can see you can watch my video on new criticism as well and formalism so that you can get a better idea of what i am trying to suggest here that new critics were always after unity coherence and meaning generation which would have uh, a life of its own a beauty of its own right deconstruction just try to undermine that it subverted the very assumption that there is a unity possible right deconstructionist would say that no there is no unity in fact there are plenty of contradictions within the text we'll come to this later so deconstruction sets out to show that conflicting forces within the text itself serve to dissipate the seeming definiteness of its structure and meanings into an indefinite array of incompatible and undecidable possibilities there are plenty of con uh, conflicts plenty of undecidable possibilities within the text and the text is just an arrangement of that apparently there is a unity apparently there is simplicity apparently there is a coherence within the text actually there is not there is no coherence at all there is no unity at all what we see is a play of signifiers all around us when whenever we look at a particular literary text so deconstruction got introduced by yak derida and uh, he is a french philosopher extremely famous and uh, you can say that frederick nietzsche who influenced derrida quite a lot is a precursor to deconstruction as nietzsche would debunk the notion of language the notion of truth you can see that the approach that deconstruction takes in the 1960s and 70s was already having some form some of some of its nature is already visible in nietzschean discourses right so deconstruction has its genesis in nietzsche's theories right and uh, deconstruction as a criticism as a critical tool in the domain of literature was developed not by derrida let me remind you not by derrida right it was developed by paul demand jeffrey hartman and uh, j hills miller harold bloom that is to say the yale school of critics right and it came to practice in the late 1960s and early 1970s and it is still quite in vogue although many people argue that the era of the high theory is no more and uh, we may have 
a separate discussion on that, that how far we should study theory in, in today's world, whether it's at all possible to deconstruct everything that matter. But for the timing, if we are uh, reading deconstruction or understanding deconstruction for the first time, we have to consider that, yes, it, it has an impact, right? Otherwise, why are we studying it right now? Okay, so Derrida arrived at deconstruction through, through Saussure's theory of language. In the previous video of mine, I have talked about Saussure's Ferdinand de Saussure, his theory of language, right? Where he talks about the signifier and the signified and how it generates meaning. Now, according to Saussure, any signified is a product of a complex interaction of several signifiers, as we have found in the previous uh, video of mine, that signifiers have, a inter have an interaction among them, right? There are plenty of signifiers available. There's a cluster. And uh, remember that example that I gave regarding the coat, coat, boat, shirt, all are uh, related signifiers. Some are related uh, in terms of pronunciation. Some are related in terms of, uh, say, generic type. So uh, they were having constant interaction among themselves. Okay, and that is what Saussure tells us. And that's why Saussure said that we have to read language synchronically. Instead of reading language diachronically, we have to read language synchronically, right? So you have to study the entire network. You have to know the lang to which all the signifiers belong. So we get a network of differences which differs the determination of the signified. Now this also we find in Saussure. So two things we find basically. One is the signified is a product of a complex interaction of several signifiers. And the second thing is that we get a network of differences, right, which differs the determination of the signified. These two things were already there. And Derrida particularly was interested in these two things, which Saussure said in his co a course on general linguistics. And uh, therefore, the signified is never present to us with its essential feature. I would give you an example and then it would be clearer to you. Because it has no positive identity. Right? The signifier, the signified is never present within the system. It is. It always evades from us. Right? Because it has no positive identity. And also, it is not absent. That is also very important. It is neither present nor absent. So that's how deconstruction loves to deal with this play, this kind of indeterminacy, this kind of uh, ambiguity that gets created. And the apparent structure does not have, a, have any center at all. Center means here the signified, right? So structuralists are very fond of the structure and structure is centered upon the signified, which is never present and never absent as well. And this signified, which is the supposed center, this quote-unquote center of the entire structure, is actually constituted by the eternal play of signifiers. It is not constituted by any specific signifier. It is, a, it is constituted by the interaction that the signifiers have among themselves. Right? So let's go back to our previous example. I have told you, I promised you that we are going to deal with the same example to understand deconstruction. The example that we used to understand structuralism, we would use the same example to understand deconstruction so that you get an idea that how from Saussure's theory of language we go towards Derridean deconstruction. Right? So this was our example where we talked about, uh, don't look at this particular area. Okay, so uh, we would come to this later. Uh, first of all, let us talk about this network. So this COAT, this signifier, this is a signifier and this COAT is leading to this apparently. And actually what happens, according to Sushor, we haven't talked about Derrida yet, right? We are talking, we are still talking about Sushor. So, Sushor says that Quote or COAT, this particular signifier does not directly lead to the signified quote. It is not actually the image that I'm talking about. It's the concept, the mental concept that it generates. Okay, 
so don't think that uh, since I have uh, used this image of the port um, there will be it's or so sure is meaning that there is an image of the port which is signified it's not the image I am what, what I want to suggest here is that this uh, brown coat yellowish brown coat is actually the mental concept right so co8 port does not lead to this signified right it does not lead to the signified in a linear way it actually leads to the signified port in a different way in a very very convoluted way in a very problematic way what is the way say whenever we see that coat is written somewhere automatically as a lightning right all the other related signifiers come to our mind and this we do unconsciously almost we have practiced it so much that it has become part of our instinct we may say right so coat is not boat is not shirt is not wrote is not hat is not boat and other innumerable or n number of signifiers so coat is not shirt not trousers not hat not cap not goat not boat right not wrote none of these related signifiers that is why coat means this signified the mental concept okay now tell me this particular coat which flashed just now what is the color of this coat is there a constant color is it uh, like this or is it uh, like this it's bigger or is it smaller what concept whenever I write or whenever I say coat or whenever I write C O A T what kind of coat do you think of is it uh, this kind of coat a green coat or is it something else now Derrida coins the word us right and this us creates a lot of problems for us now we arrive at this difference this word in a very strange way how let us go back to this now since this coat is probably not a green coat or maybe a green coat it is probably a brown coat or not a brown coat it may be a bigger coat it may be a smaller coat whatever it is now this actually this this particular coat is not very specific we do not actually know what kind of coat it actually is right and this coat this meaning is never present in this structure the signified is never present in this very structure because all we see is a play of these signifiers all the time language makes meaning in this way Lang language generates meaning in this way because it's arbitrary and it is differential right coat is different from goat coat is different from shirt coat is different from goat and other innumerable signifiers that's why probably coat leads you to some kind of signified which is never present and and that's why we cannot be sure of whether the coat is green or, or blue or black or red right whether the size is double xl or, or maybe more than that or less than that right so what is actually the problem within this system the problem is that there is an assumed center within this entire structure within this entire structure there is an there is an assumed center that is the signified the signified is actually at the center of the entire structure but this signified is not specific at all the signified cannot be known fully right that is to say essentially we do not know the proper nature of this signified now think of this signified as what we call meaning many students ask me that uh, if they are perplexed with the text they ask me that what is the meaning of this text tell me sir what specifically the meaning is and many a time it happens that 
there are multiple meanings of that text and when I tell them that there are multiple meanings of this particular text they tell me which meaning is the ultimate one or, or the best one according to you now if they are asking this question they are actually getting into the trap of an illusion right getting into the trap of the transcendental signified right they that calls this transcendental signified why because it transcends the structure it poses to be not part of the structure it poses to be a, a some something which is there already always there but actually it is not there we do not know it essentially you get my point we cannot know about it properly we can only see that the, there is a play among the signifiers and these none of these signifiers are related to the signified in a positive way you may say okay coat would only lead to some kind of signified right which is which looks like this somewhere close to this but coat is leading to this kind of signified because coat is not shirt is not goat right so coat is not leading to this kind of signified because there is a natural connection because there is no natural connection it's a random thing it's a very very arbitrary thing the relationship between the signified and the signifier is arbitrary and it is differential because it is marked by differences so that's why the signified is never ever present on the other hand we cannot deny the fact that the signified is never present totally it is we cannot say it's absent it is always there and yet we cannot know it essentially so it always slips out of our hands so that is what Derrida points out and this is this particular phenomena this slipping out of our hand this eternal play that happens creates what Derrida calls difference right difference and uh, see there is a problem with the spelling of difference right Derrida uses this spelling D I F F E R A N C E while the French word the actual French word for this is R E N C E it is spelled with R E N C E now Derrida coins this particular word difference in which he uses the spelling A N C E instead of E N C E to indicate a fusion of two senses of the French verb differer which means to be different and to differ so differer means to be different and to differ now why does Derrida mistakenly or deliberately uses the spelling of course Derrida doesn't use it mistakenly he uses it deliberately the idea is that you need to be confused you need to be uncertain regarding the privileging of speech over writing okay so many a time in in western philosophical tradition there is as Derrida points out that there is a tradition of privileging speech over writing in some traditions writing gets privileged over speech now Derrida says that there is no particular privileging writing neither writing is superior to speech nor speech is superior to writing so if I say the feroz then we don't know what kind of spelling we are using okay so deliberately to confuse you Derrida uses this particular spelling A N C E and this double sense points to the phenomenon of textual interpretation that if you are if you are listening to the word the feroz then probably you are thinking okay the spelling might be D I F F E R E N C E but Derrida says if I use A N C E you won't be able to know but it would be a different word altogether and this is how he debunks the hierarchy between speech and writing okay so this double sense points to the phenomenon of textual interpretation and there are two key points to understand this one is a text seems to have a meaning that is the product of its difference right a text seems to have a meaning that is the product of difference 
So one signifier or one particular element that you find in the text is leading you to, seemingly leading you to meaning, but actually it is just a play of several small, small signifiers within the text. And all these signifiers are having a differential relationship among themselves. And this meaning, this quote-unquote meaning, cannot be considered to be present within the text because it gets differed from one interpretation to another. Right. So that's why there is no single meaning of a text as this signified slips out of our hand, right, transpose this entire diagram into the world of textual interpretation. You would get what I want to suggest here, that the signified or the meaning is both present and absent. Not essentially present, but not totally absent within the text, within the textual framework. Right. And that's what Delta calls the trace. So we can only have a trace of the signified. And uh, language or text is like a web. And it is inherently unstable. It is marked by the conflictual network of signifiers. And there is a challenge, the structuralist idea that every structure assumes a center, that is the transcendental signified, that serves to organize or regulate the structure, yet it escapes structurality, the constructedness. Now, see the dichotomy over here. This signified is just kind of product of the play which happens within the structure, right? And yet this signified claims to be at the center of the entire thing. Now think of textual meaning. Whenever we are reading a text, a literal text, we are dealing with so many signifiers, right? And uh, say one of the signifiers is leading you to a particular meaning, which is the signifier, let us assume. Now that meaning is just a product of the play of signifiers which happens within the text because this signifier is not that signifier not that signifier and because this signifier is not that signifier because this signifier is not that signifier so I'm deliberately pointing my fingers uh, in several directions because I want to get, give you an idea of the network of signifiers so one particular signifier A is not B, is not C, is not D right, the similar signifiers which are forming the cluster that's why probably it is leading you to the signify the meaning and yet that meaning poses to be the ultimate meaning poses to govern the text and that's why many a time we think of the meaning of the text what is the ultimate meaning whenever a student asks me that is the trap into which the student is actually going into right so there is no meaning at all. There is no concrete meaning. There is no ultimate meaning of anything in the world. When deconstruction says this, it is making a very, very political statement. Now, often there is an assumption or a kind of charge hurled against the deconstructionists that they are extremely textual. They are denying the politics which lies out there, which lies beyond the text. What deconstructionists are trying to suggest is that, see, if you can understand one thing, that there is no single interpretation of any text, this attitude can be transferred to other fields as well. And then you would not take any kind of assumption, any kind of quote-unquote meaning for granted. You would question everything, you would doubt everything. Oh, this person is saying this. Is it the ultimate thing that one can think of related to this particular subject? Is he really good? Is there is something called good, which is always good, eternally good? Is it possible? Now, if you are questioning in this way, you are thinking like a deconstructionist. You are not accepting a particular transcendental signifier. And this is how Derrida debunked what he called logocentrism. 
which is according to Derrida a feature a very very cardinal feature so to speak of western philosophical tradition the tradition which comes with the enlightenment that there is a single meaning there is a single author there is a single uh, interpretation of a text right so this very idea of assuming anything to be transcendental signified only meaning which is outside the text which governs the text this very idea is known as logocentrism and in of chromatology derrida claims that there is nothing outside the text this is again a very very political statement there is nothing outside the text now the interpretation the implication of this is that whatever we see around us we can only know it as a text right so he is not actually trying to reduce everything in the textual world in fact he is not very much interested in literary criticism he is considering that there is when they when he is saying that there is nothing outside the text what he means to say is that we can only know everything around us as a text not something which is truth which is ultimate right and all that is out there is then to be read as a text so there is no certitude and the binary elements which we think about whether it is speech and writing whether it is uh, signifier signified whatever binary elements we are thinking of whether it is black white good bad right all these are interdependent think of the binary elements in terms of gender men women feminine masculine now if you if you look at these binary elements you would find that well we can easily deconstruct them because without knowing what is feminine you won't be able to know what is masculine the masculine defines itself through femininity right that is to say whenever if if i ask what is masculinity okay then you would say okay whatever is not feminine that would be the answer think about it right if i say what is modern you would say okay something which is not traditional ultimately it would go down to that because there is no essential characteristic feature of being modern being masculine so masculinity is a gender facade that gets created by patriarchy right so for derrida literary works are not distinctly different from other utterances but for paul deman one of the yale school of critics literature is different from all other utterances as it foregrounds its literariness or form now here paul deman is probably trying to bridge the gap between deconstruction and formalism for that matter because literariness form these are these have already been highlighted by the formalists and literature unlike other discourses is aware of its fabricated nature so the text deconstructs itself right for paul deman uh, literary texts deconstruct themselves while other texts need external intervention to be deconstructed so this is the difference between paul deman and yak derrida so uh, we would uh, continue our discussion on other theories uh, where we would talk about post structuralism primarily and because we have already arrived at the juncture of post structuralism we have arrived at the period of post structuralism with the discussion on deconstruction hope you have liked this video enjoyed this video and you have uh, come to know about deconstruction and now you continue your study and if you have any question you can definitely ask me right thanks a lot for watching